Hi, a very good evening to all the literature enthusiasts present here today. Prabhaketan Foundation is a social non-governmental organization based out of Kolkata, founded by late Dr. Prabhaketan. The foundation's activities are aimed towards betterment in the arena of education, culture, art, literature, and performing arts. Alongside, it also aims to encourage gender equality and women empowerment. Today, Prabhaketan Foundation, in association with Penguin Random House through its initiative, Kitab, brings to you the launch of the book, A Burning, <coughs> by Megha Majumdar. During this time of worldwide pandemic, where all of us are practicing social distancing, Prabhaketan Foundation has successfully transformed all its physical events to the virtual ones. A very good morning to you, uh, our guest author, Megha Majumdar. Good morning. It's 9 in the New York. 9 a.m. in the right. New York. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Megha Majumdar was born and raised in Kolkata. She moved to the United States to attend college at Harvard University, where she has a scholar followed by graduate school in social anthropology at Johns Hopkins University. She, she works as an associate editor at Catapult and lives in New York City. A Burning is her first book, the book is one of the most highly anticip anticipated debuts of 2020. Set in a contemporary India spinning towards extremism, irrevocably intertwined in the wake of devastating act of domestic terrorism. An extraordinary voice at the start of a brilliant career, Mazumdar is a powerful advocate for fiction's capacity to tackle issues of class, gender, justice, corruption, and political upheaval. She will be in conversation with Nilanjana Roy. Good evening, Nilanjana. Nilanjana Roy is the author of two fantasy novels, The Wildings and The Hundred Names of Darkness, and is working on her third book, Black River. She definitely wants to shift to Himalaya after Kolkata, to Delhi, and Goa. <laughs> now I request Nilanjana and Megha to unveil the book, The Burning, A Burning, and start the conversation. We're going to do this the formal way, which is basically you rip the paper off that somebody has very carefully gift wrapped. Gift <laughs> by Delhi's Midlands Bookshop. And uh, Megha, Mila, so Mega, can you show your book now, yes. please? <laughs> I think the video froze for me, so I can only hear the audio, but okay. here's, here's my US copy. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Before I end, I would like to mention that there will be a question and answer session. Please post the conversation on the uh, chat box, which will be then relate to both the, the both the authors. Thank you so much. Mega, it's so exciting to be starting this conversation with you. And thank you for sharing your morning with us. Uh, a Burning received reviews that would have been extraordinary, except that the book itself was completely extraordinary. And it starts with a young woman who's disturbed by something she witnesses the burning of a train in which many hundred, a hundred people die in a near riot situation in Calcutta, Kolkata. She comes back and she writes a Facebook post that she herself admits later might be unwise. And that post says, if the police didn't help ordinary people like you and me, if the police watched them die, doesn't that mean, I wrote on Facebook, that the government is also a terrorist? And from that moment on, Jeevan's life changes. There are three characters in, uh, three main characters in a burning. There's Jeevan, 
her friend or loosely an acquaintance lovely who's a, a transvestite who has ambitions of becoming an actress and uh, the very intriguing pt sir who starts off as an ordinary school teacher and slowly rises in power up the rungs of a right wing extremist party mega it was completely fascinating and i wanted to start by asking you how did these characters come to you was it through reading the news or was it through experiencing or witnessing things in calcutta thank you uh thank you so much for that very generous introduction to the book um and thank you for speaking with me today um i think you're right that the book was very much nourished by what i was reading in the news um i wanted to follow these three particular questions you know i wanted to see how somebody who works really hard really earnestly can still be thwarted by the systems and institutions that she lives within so that's kind of where jeevan came from lovely um i wanted to write this bold joyous defiant arc for a character who wants to go from the very margins of society to the center i mean the the dream that she holds of becoming a movie star is i think one of the wildest possible dreams right um the third character pt sir he's a school teacher you know i wanted to see how somebody who feels that um his his work is not really having a vigorous impact on the nation what does this person do when he gets a taste of political power you know what will he surrender what morals will he hold on to and what will he give up so those were the kind of three driving questions for these three uh, uh, characters uh, sorry to interrupt you uh, megha can you just check your video is froze actually oh no sorry. um it's okay we can hear you we just want to pause second while we sort out a video uh, issue and we're going to hope that megha's uh, video link comes back should i leave and rejoin we we could try that okay let me try that okay if you've just joined the conversation with megha mojumdar our author of a burning she's having a little trouble with the video feed but we've only just started so she's going to leave and rejoin the conversation in a second and what we were talking about was the three main characters of a burning it's a very tightly plotted story and uh, the book follows each character one after the other but mega you know something i found uh, really beautiful was and uh, re- really attractive was that all characters even uh, the right wing extremist you know slowly coming into um quarrels with his conscience which he successfully ignores as he pulls deeper and deeper into something quite dark uh but everyone is conveyed with both empathy and compassion and also you don't rescue them you know you don't rescue them from their sorted problems aside from the plot i thought that the thing that really connected them was that all three of them have big dream of transcending the place that they come from and uh, i don't want to add spoilers here but let's just say that maybe a, a couple of the characters make it and maybe uh, one of them doesn't <laughs> and i feel that very strongly this whole thing about the dreams that you are given permission to dream and the dreams that are absolutely impossible did you write from a sense of seeing that injustice and caring about it deeply yes absolutely um i think that you know the place where this kind of injustice makes itself felt is in that place where somebody is denied the opportunity to dream right somebody is told this is your place in society this is all you're going to get so what happens if somebody refuses to accept that you know and they say um i have the right to improve my life i have the right to reach for 
that feels meaningful and valuable to me. Um, and especially, you know, I felt that um, in the character of Lovely, who is burdened by so much shame, you know, she's surrounded by people who seek to shame her, um, but she doesn't accept that shame, you know, she, she defies that shame. Um, and so much of this book is about the constraints that society places upon certain people more than others and how people still don't surrender their spirit, don't surrender their dreams. I think there is an essential optimism in the book and that's where that optimism comes from. I wanted to ask also about the place. Um, it was remarkable to me, you spent several years in the US now, you're an editor in New York. Uh, but you write about Calcutta, Kolkata, which is where both of us grew up, as though it's right there, you know, as though you're sitting there and writing the book uh, in that city. Everything about it from, and there's three very different parts to the book. Uh, Jeevan grows up in a slum and she's trying to transcend that. She's become an assistant store manager at the pantaloon store in a mall. And that gives her the right to dream bigger and bigger. And Lovely moves through a kind of halfway in between world. You know, uh, on one hand, there's theater classes. And uh, on the other, the place that she comes from is also very rough edged. And PT Sir has a school where he can't relate to the children he's teaching. He looks at them. And one of the points in the book where he moves closer towards nationalism is he says, what is their lives about? You know, just laughing and joking around and there's nothing serious to them. And he's moving in again in search of something else. Uh, what was your childhood like in Kolkata? Did you see it more as a Bengali city or more as an English city? Because, you know, this book, in a sense, it feels to me as though it's written in English, but it has this lovely shadow of Bengali behind it. I'm so happy to hear you say that, you know, I think Bengali holds a kind of richness and pathos and a capacity for both sentiment and humor, um, which I think all Bengali speakers understand. And even though I wrote the book in English, um, I, I hope that there are scenes where that really comes out, you know, that attempt to capture the richness of feeling and thought in Bengali. Um, my childhood in Kolkata was, um, you know, I, I grew up in a middle class home. Um, I went to a show call for anybody watching who also went there. Um, and, you know, we were encouraged to watch the news, read the newspaper. You know, we would discuss um, what was happening at the dinner table. Um, my parents were always very encouraging of my reading. Um, from a very early age, I was a I was a big reader. I was called the bookworm in the family, and you know we would uh, seek out libraries and we would seek out um, you know secondhand bookstores. And sometimes we would go to you know the bookstore on the Oxford bookstore and and get um, whatever I could get my hands on. So I was a big reader, and that was a big part of my childhood. You know, um, I. And I read very well, you know, I read travel stories, I read mysteries, um, I read folk tales. So reading was a big part of it. And paying attention to the world is, I think, something that reading cultivates in you, right? Because you are paying attention to all of these imaginative worlds in books, you are primed to pay attention to the world that is around you, right? You are able to see what is interesting and surprising and nuanced in the world around you, I think. That's fascinating because people often ask novelists, how did you do your research? And I look at that and I think with your book, it, was, it might have been a lot of research. There's a lot of uh, things that you fold neatly into the background, but I think a lot of it was also observation, right? But did you know right from the start that you wanted to be a writer? You have one of the trademarks of somebody who eventually becomes a writer, which is we sneakily choose jobs that allows us to hang around books and, <laughs> you know, be an editor with your first book out. Yeah. But did you, did you write stories when you were younger? 
I did. You know, I used to participate in writing competitions and essay competitions when I was a kid, um, like I think so many of us did. Um, and I always had an affinity for books. You know, that's, that's like you said, partly why um, I started working as an editor, because being in that place where you can boost someone's work, you know, you can help create a new book that is then in a bookstore, that still feels really magical to me. Um, and I think, you know, just being close to books in that way also definitely fuels my writing. Um, because you read such a huge volume of manuscripts as an editor, you learn what kind of sentence level surprise or what kind of structure or what kind of movement appeals to you. And then you have something to reach for in your own writing. And it took about four years for you to get this book down. I mean, that's, that's right. amazing. So much of a job. Um, I did so many drafts. It's hard for me to say how many drafts I had because I'm such a constant rewriter. You know, I'm always tinkering, always going over the pages that I have. And so one draft kind of becomes another at some point and that becomes the next. I mean, I'm sure you know this, you're, you're a writer as well. Um, that constant tinkering, you know, um, and the whole time that I was writing this book, I also had a full-time job. So that was part of it. You know, I had to sneak, um, you know, an hour before work on some mornings or find some hours on the weekend to write. So this was definitely something that I felt like I was doing on the side um, while managing my job. It's so important when you're doing that to stay connected, to never drop the writing, right? Absolutely. Uh, you have any difficult choices about language and voice and uh, two questions one came from a reader who loved your book and who was curious about the name that you gave Jeevan he said that it's an unusual name not an unnatural but an unusual name for a young Muslim woman but Jeevan also means life and so I was just wondering whether that thought was uppermost in your mind the other is a lot of people remarked on um, Lovely's voice you know uh, for most readers, we sense that there's something a little jarring about putting it in the present tense. But at the same time, I think we're so aware that her character is beautifully drawn. You know, often if a, if a voice is set in a register that feels wrong to you, you say, oh, the character is not well thought out, but that's not what's happening here. I wondered whether uh, at, at some point you also get used to Lovely's voice and then you just stay with her and you stay with that story. But I wondered specifically with Lovely, were you translating from one kind of Bengali into English? Because, you know, it's so, it's so difficult to make that fit. What were the choices you made with the voices of each character? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so your first question about, about Jeevan, uh, I know that it is typically a boy's name and it probably doesn't quite fit. And I knew that, you know, that would probably be something that snags some readers' minds. Um, you know, the name, it just, it came to me in one of the very earliest drafts. And later I tried changing it to be something that would feel more logical for this character, but it never felt right. I always kept going back to Jeevan, even though I knew that there were a lot of reasons why that would not be the perfect name. But in the end, it felt right to me. And, you know, that's the freedom you have as a fiction writer. Um, because uh, Jeevan, from the moment that we meet her, she's put in a situation of tremendous risk. I don't think it spoils the uh, plot to say that she finds herself in prison in the middle of a media storm being accused of being a terrorist, right? And then to have a name like Jeevan to hold on to is just a reminder of life, right? It's a reminder of everything that she wanted. In that sense, it might be an edgy choice, but it was the right choice. I'm glad you think so, Nilanjana. <laughs> um, with Lovely's voice, you know, I, um, 
I wanted to gesture to the complicated colonial history of English in India. And I wanted to acknowledge how English now sits in this place of, um, you know, aspiration. It's the language of the elite. You know, you have all of these spoken English classes. And, you know, when we were growing up, I don't know if this was your experience, but I would, I would guess that it filtered through to you too. We were told that English is the language of moving up. English is the language you have to learn, you know, and then you were praised for speaking English well, you know. Um, so that sense of aspiration and striving felt very important to this character, you know, and I wanted to write this English which gets that register of striving. So it is non-standard, um, but I never wanted it to be seen as subpar. It was the English that fit into her life, you know, it was the English that this character made her own. That helps me understand a lot better, you know, and and then you see the struggle of somebody who's taking a language not her own, but also making it her own step by step and expressing herself very clearly in that. It's such an optimistic book, but it also goes into very dark territory and very contemporary, very urgent territory. I think one of the things that you've got, not just from reviewers, but from readers, is a little shock that a book that you probably finished a year ago or a year and a half ago feels so urgent. It feels so urgently written into the moment. I don't know whether you ever said to yourself that you were going to write political fiction, but it is so connected with the politics of these times in both the US and in India. You know, uh, what we are seeing in the sense of the politics of anger, what we are seeing in the sense of fake news having a direct and disastrous impact on people's lives. So much of that is in there. Did you write it from anger as well? Keep repeating the question. You froze for a second. I'm so sorry. I think both are video links. So. I was saying that you may not have, I don't know whether you consciously said, I'm going to write political fiction, but it is a book that speaks very much to the politics of where we are today. And to me, I think there would be a resonance in the US as much as in India, because in a sense, we're mirroring each other, aren't we? You know, we're seeing extremism rising in both countries. We're seeing terrible injustice, sometimes fueled by the media. And did you write out of a kind of anger as well? Because I feel a kind of contained anger behind, very beautifully controlled, but it's there. There's I'm such so an- glad you picked up on it. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I think our videos are lagging a little bit. Um, but yeah, I think I, I was definitely writing from a place of alarm, you know, seeing um, the rise in hate crimes, the rise in intolerance. Um, and mm -hmm. certainly in the US as well, I think it has felt very eerie to have the book launch into this moment because um, as you noted, you know, I wrote the book over several years and I finished writing it um, a while ago. So it feels very chilling that it's launching into this moment when things like, you know, systems of oppression, um, discriminatory systems, police brutality and indifference, all of these are so much at the front of mind here in the US as well. So it has definitely felt very strange. When I look at the similarities between the US and India, I want to ask also whether, I don't know whether you're, or you've already started writing your next book, but would you consider setting a book in America as well that explores similar issues, perhaps issues of justice? So a large part of a burning that was fascinating for me was uh, the exploration of the prison system, you know, and the different layers of injustice. At one point, one of the characters who's in the same prison as uh, Jeevan, she says something and Jeevan says, so often your freedom, I'm misquoting, but so often your freedom or your existence depends on whether you get to tell your story or not. 
I see that as a central concern for you, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think with this book, what you're trying to do is not to tell somebody else's story, but to say these are the stories that don't get told, and there is a cost to not telling them. And for all three of your characters, could you talk a little bit about how it works for P.T. Sir and Lovely and Jeevan separately? What do they get to say about their lives and what do they not get to say and how does that affect them? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right that Jeevan is very concerned with being able to tell her story. Um, part of the book's concern is the power of telling your own story. You know, who gets to be the protagonist of their own story? Who gets to tell their own version? And who has their story co-opted? And who has a narrative logic imposed upon them? Um, the story of Jeevan, for example, um, there are quite a few scenes in the book which show her, you know, struggling to stay in school, struggling to secure a reliable water supply, struggling to help her parents make a living, that kind of thing. And, but the, but the narrative logic imposed on her by the state only sees certain aspects of her identity and says, well, these fit together, so they must be the narrative of her life, right? So I think that kind of imposition of an easy narrative on anyone's life is really dangerous, right? And some people are more vulnerable to it than others. So I really wanted to look at the power of storytelling. What happens when your story is... Um, twisted by a nationalist media to fit a certain idea. What happens when your story is not allowed the complexity that it holds? Um, and this concern with storytelling is definitely spread across the three main characters. And I think it also surfaces in, um, there are these tiny sections in the book called interludes, which um, follow minor characters for a short while. Um, and they're, I saw them as just kind of opening these imaginative doors and allowing a reader to see, look, there are all of these incredibly complex stories that you can follow if you wanted to. You know, I chose to follow these three characters in depth in depth, but there are all of these others. So, you know, stories are all around us and it is up to us to recognize them in their complexity. I loved it actually that you gestured at so many stories and you have a sense as the reader that they're carrying on off the page, you know, but you, you have a sense of their importance. And uh, you were very clear right from the start that while this is a book that has obviously traveled very far and it's been received well by readers in the US and the UK, but right from the start you wrote it not just for Indian audiences, I had a sense that you would want the characters you wrote about to be able to read it, and was that on your mind? Did you, would you want it to be translated, for example, into Bengali and Hindi and Marathi? That's such a beautiful question, you know. I never thought about my characters reading this book. I would hope that they think I did their lives justice. The most important thing for me was to render each character in a complex way, you know, to let them hold contradictions, to let them hold flaws, to let them hold generosity and selfishness, you know, moments where they are doing the right thing, doing the moral thing, and moments where they are considering doing something that's not right. Um, and so I hope that that fullness rings true to them. Um, and about translation, I mean, that would, be, that would be such a dream. That would be such an honor. I hope it happens. Can we talk a bit about your life as an editor? Uh, and a rookie question, but did you, did you at any point of time try to edit your own book? And how did you separate a less rookie question? How did you separate the two parts of yourself in that sense? Because as an editor, you always have to be immersed in a text, but at a little bit of a distance from it. And as a writer, it's different. You know, you're, you're, you might be orchestrating it, but at the same time, the story is pulling you along in a certain way. And did you even try to look at your manuscript with an editorial eye or did you say, no, 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 somebody else do it? 
<laughs> I definitely edited my book. Um, so much of writing is revising and editing, you know, um, like you know very well. Um, and so part of what I found really helpful was to put the manuscript down for a few weeks at a time. And, um, you know, when you come to this place where you feel that you've been reading your pages over and over, you can no longer see what the story is. You can no longer spot, you know, any flaws or any um, gaps. So you put it down and then you come back to it. And I felt that coming back to it, I was able to look at it as a reader might. And I was able to ask the questions um, that I ask as an editor of the manuscripts that come to my desk, you know. So those questions include, um, very importantly, things like, why should a reader care? You know, what are the stakes of this book? Why does this book um, need to make a claim on a reader's time. So that was a kind of harsh, but I felt important question that I asked of the book quite a lot. Um, I thought of the book as this act of invitation, you know, and I wanted the book to hold a reader's attention from page to page, chapter to chapter. Um, I thought a lot about things like velocity, you know, how does each paragraph and each chapter move the book forward? And how does it do so while also allowing the characters space? So, you know, you have to move forward in a book, but you also have to dig deep in your book, right? So how do we make both of those kinds of movement happen at once? Um, I thought about things like clarity, you know, um, in the opening pages of any book, when a reader, they want to know or at least I want to know who the people are. What is the world that we're in? What is the time that we're in? So you need to have absolute clarity about what is this place and what is happening because um, I think confusion and boredom are the enemy of any writer's efforts, right? So I wanted to avoid those things. I was very attentive to how Readers have scarce time, you know, they don't have all the leisure time in the world to spend with your books. So I wanted to make a very conscious effort to have a book that moves swiftly, that holds its pace, um, that has something intellectually serious to say, but that also feels fun. You know, a book that you can come home from work and pick up and feel that it rewards your time. It is a serious book, though. It has one of the best studies of, uh, you know, extremism. The moment that we say the right wing or extremists, often they depicted as external figures, you know, agents of chaos, agents of violence. But here you manage to not just humanize somebody, but you manage to also lay out how seductive it is to have a certain kind of power. There's a section in the book where P.T. Sir goes to a rally. Somebody puts a tikka, tikka on his head. And when he's returning in the train, he's offered a free plate of jalmuri, of muri, you know. Just something as simple as that, out of respect. But that little gesture of respect is actually what draws him closer and closer to power, up to the point where he witnesses horror, and he might even be complicit in some of it. But there's a constant overcoming of one's scruples in the service of something larger. Are you concerned about the rise of authoritarianism and extremism in both countries? That you know, I mean, you know India and the US so well. And yeah. I know that you didn't make this a political pamphlet, but you end with a little bit of a question. It's not a happy ending in the sense of it doesn't say, oh, extremism is going to be conquered. You know, right. there's a series about which you see it and about which you see the pull and the force exist it exerts on people. Yeah, you know, I wanted to look at how somebody who feels themselves powerless in this society with huge power differentials, what might this person do when they get this proximity to political power, you know? This is not, I hope, not a flat villain. Um, I didn't want to write just a simple bad person. 
I wanted to write an ordinary person who realizes that in order to climb up in this society, in order to make a better life for himself and his family, he has to make certain sacrifices. And the question of whether he will do something for the greater good or something to benefit only himself, I think that's a question that um, I hope that a reader will be able to find themselves paying close attention to. Um, and you know, this, this character, it was just a way for me to look at and ask what such a person might do, you know? I hope that there are no tidy conclusions, you know? Like you said, it's not a pamphlet and there's no, oh, this is going to happen, but I wanted to reflect um, what I do see happening and how a person who doesn't have evil intentions might find themselves caught up in this machinery because it presents, you know, the very system that oppresses him and limits his choices is also the system, you know, uh, an opening, a way to climb up. So what is he going to do? I think what you also bring to light is that it is so seductive to do terrible things if it's in the service of something that is highly idealistic, even something that you can say is in the greater good of the nation. And that comes through well. These are being very serious questions. So, you know, we're moving towards the end of the conversation. And I just wanted to ask, what is the happiest thing about writing the book? I, I know you've had this, all this dream uh, run after publication. Uh, the New Yorker gave you a thoughtful and really, really um, enthusiastic review. The New York Times book reviewers, both of them, have loved the book. And Indian reviewers, again, have said it resonates with them. Um, I think it's not just the success of being noticed in these publications. It's also that people get the book. They want to talk about it, you know, and that, that is special. But what is happiest for you about the writing and about the success? Okay, go ahead. Talk about both. Um, I mean, I've been very grateful for the attention, you know, I, I wrote this like I think most writers starting out do just very quietly on your own time. Nobody knows about it. Um, and to go from that place where this is just this private document that I'm working on to seeing it as a book that people are reading and responding to, I've been very grateful for that care and for that thoughtfulness and everything that people are bringing to it. Um, and at the same time, you know, the, the work is, is where it is for me. I think the hours that you can spend immersed in your book or your essay or short story or whatever you're working on, the time that you spend completely in that world with your characters, making these little creative choices, um, I think that is the most rewarding and fulfilling part of it for me, where you can really be in conversation with yourself and ask questions that you want to ask. The reaction I had after I finished reading A Burning was unfair because I immediately wanted to read your next book, which I know might take time, but are you going to continue committed to the novel or are you moving into essays, short stories? I am actually working on a second novel, which um, I won't say too much about it because I'm waiting for it to find its legs, but it is a very different book. Wonderful to hear that. I think the audience is eager to ask questions. So I'm going to hand over, but thank you so, so much for your wonderfully clear, precise, and precise answers. Thank you so much, Nilanjana. I, I mean, I know that you have a million things on your plate and your thoughtful and deep engagement is really an honor. Thank you. Um, should we hand over um, to Isha? Welcome back. And uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, we do have a question, so I'll just call it out. Okay, Megha, this is for you. Okay. Uh, well, I'll take the first one. Hi, Megha. 
tore through a burning this past week and I was wondering what was on your personal reading list while writing the book. Do you purposely read fiction which is of similar themes to what you are writing to inspire you and immerse you? Or do you stay away from reading similar fiction for that very reason? Thank you. Um, thank you so much. That's a great question. I typically read very widely and um, I don't really change that while I'm writing. I read a lot of fiction. Um, I read whatever catches my eye. So, you know, some books that I found um, really inspiring. Um, I'm thinking about this book called The Dreamers by Snigta Poonam, which is a work of nonfiction. Um, it's, it's a work of journalism looking at millennials in small towns across India. And, you know, there's a person who learns to be a model by watching YouTube videos. And um, there's this uh, young student politician who is the first woman to stand for elections in her college. And she survives a very violent election season. So um, that kind of book, which is rich, which um, helps you understand um, how to write people, how to bring them to the page in ways that preserve their fullness and robustness. That kind of book um, I really love. But yeah, I'm always reading fiction and nonfiction. I mean, I love people like Daniel Muinuddin, who is um, an author who wrote this short story collection called In Other Rooms, Other Wonders several years ago. Um, which is a book that I really loved. I thought it was so rich. Um, I love this book called um, We Need New Names by No Violet Bulawayo. Um, it's set in Zimbabwe and it has child characters who are so mischievous and skeptical and spirited and Assuming you're a writer, there's a very writerly question. Um, you know that children are very hard to write in complex ways. So I found that um, really rich. Yeah. Okay, we'll take the next one. Sorry, I think. Yeah. Okay, uh, that first question was from Bhavika Govil. Sorry, I forgot to mention her name. Uh, the next one is from Avantika Akerkar. Uh, when did you know that the book was ready? I ask because you mentioned that you have a habit of constantly rewriting sentences, paragraphs, and pages. And a follow-up. Would you now change anything in the book after having participated in so many public interactions and being interviewed? Um, I think I knew, I think every writer feels, I certainly feel that there are ways in which you could keep editing your book forever. Even now when I dip into the book and I look at some pages, I see sentences that I would write differently and edit. Um, so I think that process is truly never ending. You could write one book forever. I let it go when I felt like it was doing what I wanted it to do. Um, you know, and perhaps it was doing it imperfectly, um, but I felt that I had brought it to a place where I could stand behind it and be proud of it. Um, and it was asking the questions that I wanted it to ask. Um, and the second part of your question, I'm sorry, can you remind me what it was? Yeah, I'll just tell you. Uh, would you now change anything in the book after having participated in so many of these interactions? I think a book is written in a very private place. It's written in a place of solitude and having conversations can help you see aspects of the book that you perhaps hadn't seen before. But I think I respect the integrity of the book as it took shape in that place of solitude. It's just perfect. <laughs> okay, the next question. Um, next good day, evening, uh, Megha. Isha, let's take the yeah. first question and then uh, you can read out the other question. Which one? Vidhi Patel, I put her on uh, audio. Hey, uh, I live in India, okay. uh, so I haven't read your book. Uh, frankly, it's probably available now, but uh, 
you, you seem to have said it in Calcutta without mentioning Calcutta. That's what I read in a review. I think New York Times said that. Uh, but my question is really that all the good books about Calcutta seem to be coming from abroad. You are there. Jumka Lahiri is there. Amitabh Ghosh is there. Bharti Mukherjee before. Does the distance from Calcutta help you write better about Calcutta? Mm -hmm. Well, I can only speak for myself. Um, I felt that perhaps having some distance from the place allowed me to sharpen my focus um, and allowed me to reflect on the place, but also the reason that, you know, I, I hesitate to say um, that this is Kolkata is because I think any reader will recognize that this is a Kolkata with various fictional aspects. Um, so I wanted that freedom in the space of fiction. Um, and that's kind of why I made that choice. But the distance from Cal Calcutta, does it help you write better about Calcutta, you think? Well, I have nothing to compare it to. There is no control here. So I don't know how I would write if I were living in Kolkata. But um, I hope that I have written about the place in a way which feels rich and rings true to those who are living there now. Thank you. But we don't have time, unfortunately. Isha, you can read out the questions from the Q&A box. There are a lot of questions in the Q&A box. Indita, can we take questions? Uh, should I read it out? Isha, can you see the questions on the Q&A box? Go ahead. I think we've not uh, connection with uh, Isha D. Isha. Mm. Okay. Uh, Mega, there is this question from Amir. Mr. Amir. He is saying, that, tell us what criticism have you heard about the book? As so far, we have heard only good things. Sorry, I haven't read the book so far. Just a second. Do you want me to read out the Isha, I've read out Amir's oh. question, so uh, Megha... And that you had a... So I I'm can, just reading out the question on Indita. I'm just reading it out. Okay. Yeah. Can you all both hear me? Yes. Now yeah, we okay. Hear. Okay. Uh, tell us what criticism have you heard about the book so far, as we have heard only good things. Uh, this is from Amir, and um, he said, sorry, he hasn't read the book so far. Um, I think every reader can make up their own mind about the book and come to their own points of things they agreed with and disagreed with and liked and didn't like. Um, I think I heard... So there's a character in the book called Lovely, whose voice um, I think some people loved, some people found a little bit jarring, um, which was very interesting for me to see. Okay. <laughs> okay, just uh, next one quickly. Uh, Megha, you said that you had a job while working on this book, which is quite tiring. What kept you motivated to continue writing? Um, I think motivation comes so much from that place of inner discipline, you know. I, I knew that I wanted to write this book. I knew that I wanted to tell the story. And I also knew that nobody was waiting for it, you know. There was no, you know, eager reader waiting for my book. So it was up to me to write this. Um, and... 
it was just that place of knowing that I wanted to do it. And if I didn't do it, that I would regret it, you know? So you have to reach into that place of, I think, inner discipline and quietness where the only expectation comes from yourself, where you want to do the work that you know you can do. Right. Okay, and there are two other questions. I'll just combine it into one. Uh, one is, uh, what is your favorite book? And the next question is, what is your advice to aspiring writers? Um, there are so many books that I love. I would probably have a different answer for you depending on when you asked me. Um, a book that I really love is called Bad News. It's by Anjan Sundaram. It's a book of nonfiction. Um, and it's a book about going to this journalist's workshop in Rwanda and looking at the ways in which journalists are persecuted by the state. It's, a, it's an incredibly powerful book. Um, highly, highly recommend. And then for a book of fiction, um, I really liked Anuradha Roy's book, Folded Earth. Um, it's set in a hill station. It follows this woman who builds a new life as a school teacher after a tragedy. Um, and what I loved about that book is it pays such close attention to um, the environment and the, the place and the nature. And you hear about, you know, the animals and the flowers and just what it feels like to be in that hill station. So I found it a really rich book in that way. Um, and advice for an aspiring writer was, I think, the second question. Um, I think I would say, you know, find find the thing that moves you, that angers you, that you want to keep talking about and write from that place of strong feeling. I think that place of feeling is such a source of fuel and energy. So I would definitely hold that close. And then the other part of it is, you know, it's often, writing is often so solitary and so quiet and there are always other fun things you could be doing with your afternoon um, but you have to stick with it you know something that I told myself while I was working on this is um, an unfinished novel is not a novel so you have to finish what you start very true <laughs> Thank you so much. I think we've, that's a wrap of all the questions. And thank you, Megha and Ilanjana. It was a delightful session, as always. And uh, yes, there we have the book. I yes. There's one very interesting question. I just thought I'll read it out. Oh, one more. Come up. Okay, read it out, yeah. Anindita. Uh, this is from Sharvari Parasneet. She's saying that I am curious to know what made you choose a PT sir as your male protagonist. <laughs> Why is he male? Um, I think part of it came from how he occupies this kind of outsider status at the school where he's not quite like the other teachers. He's a little apart from them. You know, he, his classes are a little different. Um, he can't quite join in with the other teachers. And that sense of slight alienation felt important to harness for this character. Okay, that's great. I have no more questions in my chat box. On Indita, are we done? I mean, you can ask. Please Sorry? Go Please go ahead, and, go ahead and ask. No, I said there aren't any more questions in my chat box. Should I wrap up the session? Yes. We've had a lot of questions uh, yeah 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 I okay so that's right so great i was just thanking both our panelists both megha and ilanjana thank you so much for joining us today it was really delightful and uh, megha all the best for your future book novel fiction non-fiction whichever and uh, i'm sure it's going to be as 
exciting as this one and all the very best for that and uh, i'll thank just also so take much. this opportunity to thank prabha petan foundation and penguin random house and um, well we'll see you for the next session to all our audience thank you good morning and a good day to you megha and a very good evening to the rest of you thank, thank you thank you so much asha thank you ananda thank, thank you so much for the book and thank you for the invitation to all of you at the prabha ketan foundation wonderful being in conversation with you thank you